counting down to our launch date. Five, four, three, two, one. I just don't want any flying chunks of heat in the paint. Okay, I don't either. This is the act of determining a plank's shape, width, length, and taper, and all that other stuff. I use a hot milk glue gun to glue the yellow cedar. These are handy little spiling block here. Can we bend it down? Right. Let's see the water line there. Port seven, number two. Here is the new addition to the family, Doug's electric bicycle. September 17th. We're counting down to our launch date. Five, four, three, two, one. How's this wood holding up? Awesome. All right, seven from the top, 10 from the bottom. We've got about nine to go over on this side. Cut out number eight on the starboard side to a certain point. And now I'm gonna, pieces that are left over on the frames, we're gonna get them with the air gun. Okay. Just saves a lot of chiseling and hammering and busted knuckles. It would just saves us a lot of time. All right, let's see it. Let's see if we had to sit here and chisel this by hand, we'd be bang, 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 bang. Okay. I think the first couple of lower courses we try, though, there's gotta be a faster way. <laughs> it saves on the pounding too, pounding on the frames. You know, these, some of these frames aft are so tiny and you know, you don't wanna bang on them. So we'll get these out and then we'll remove the fasteners, all the ones that we can. Some of the fasteners are buried behind these blocks. These blocks right here in the longitudinals. Right. Some of the planks, in fact a lot of them were put on, the planks were put on and then they put the longitudinals on. So this fastener right here, if you feel around, it's underneath this block when they riveted the boat. Okay. The head of this fastener is right in this. Uh. So there's no way to remove it. So what we do is grind it flat. This. We'll get two screws right here. I'm gonna be going this way, so I don't know if it'd be better. I just don't want any flying chunks to hit you in the face. Okay, I don't either. Okay, hang on. That's like a freaking rocket. Yeah, it's gnarly. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Then what we do is we go back and I'll straighten these rivets out, and any of them that the heads are on the back. I'll take a hammer and loosen them, pound them in a little bit, cut them off, and punch them through with a punch. After I've removed all the screws by hand or gun. Very nice. All right, only 46 more times. Yeah. You just gotta be careful not to hit the frames. Nice. But I mean, just watching you do this, looks like this is, as you say, over a day to take out a plank, correct? Oh, easily. Easy. Easily. And this one especially right here, you can see the longitudinal. You can see this, if you look down at this angle, this longitudinal pretty much follows these two planks for a long ways right in the belly okay. of the here. It yeah. doesn't smile or frown like the lower and upper ones. Okay. So there's a lot of bolts to put in here. And we do them while we can. Well, we got the frame off. So this this uh, board up in here, yeah, this is the lo longitudinal. longitudinal right there. And see these bolts? Those are our new bolts, right? Those are the new bolts going into the old holes from the old rivets. Right. See, like this, let me see. I'll feel, what I'll do is I feel on the back here, and that's an upper one. Okay. You can feel it, I've already tapped Pat, it up. Yeah. So that, it's this one right here. Right. It'll be that now upper one. Now you'll pop that and out. The lower one will be this one. Okay. And so I just go down, what I do is I'll pop I'll take it out, put the bolt in. Take it out, put the bolt in. I don't just take them all out. You don't want that longitudinal floating. Yeah. As you can see, this one goes uh, and it goes back up the boat. So this one is also at the water line. And a lot of these fasteners here, as you get down here close to the water line, see how thin that fastener is right there? That's after a lot of wear. Yeah. So a lot of these, I can't even punch them. I'll have to go inside and grind. If I can reach them, I'll grind them grind the heads off in there and punch them back out this way. Punch them out the other way. Which is hard in a lot of spots because you have framing or this and that. 
So any of the ones like that that we can't get out, we grind off and we put a screw in. All right, we'll see that in a little bit. Yeah. Here. yeah. Anything we see split that needs to be patched, such as plywood that's delaminated on the bulkheads, we put a little epoxy in there, glue it as we go down. Right. You know? Yeah, that one looks a little like rough that. right yeah, there. Yeah, that one's, you can see the, they were off on the side there. They missed it. So you're not going to follow those old holes? No, this will get screws. You see how thin that bulkhead is right there? Okay. We don't ever shoot our screws in the ingrain of plywood. No, no. So we'll go to this right here. This is this is lumber right here. So gotcha. these will get screws because you just can't get inside there and get a good, you can't get the drill that close to the bulkhead to make a nice hole. Well, we're going to talk about spiling. This is the act of determining a plank's shape, width, length, and taper, and all that other stuff. You got to figure out how this plank's going to fit because all planks on all boats are tapered and have some shape or other. These these planks now are starting to to, to create a rainbow shape because the boat's getting fatter and the plank has to go around that hill. Whereas up there they had a slight smile in them. There's no two planks alike. So we have our big slab here from the tree. And uh, this is what we call a spiling bat. There's about eight different ways to, to spile planks. And over the years I've settled on this, it's the fastest and most accurate. First thing you do up in the bow is you make a pattern of the stem, of the stem rabbit. This is the plank above, the line is right here. And this line describes the plank below. And of course, this is the angle of the stem rabbit. It gets you pretty close. And these little marks along here are from the spiling block. You might want to home in on these. So the way you do it is you draw this line and then this line down. That way you know that the, the block goes this way and on this one it goes that way. I have about five or six of these different sizes. This is 1A. <laughs> um, and so, this, these are homemade, but not bad for an amateur. So these are what you pick up the actual shape from the, from the boat. And then when they bring the spiling batten down from the boat, these lines are then transferred. That's the bottom edge of the plank. And this is the top edge of the plank. All the way down to each frame. It's very fast, as you'll see. Once you get the batten up, uh, it's very quick to, to use this block. To he just butts this up against the plank above it, marks on the spiling bed, turns it around, it goes down to the plank line that's on the frame, marks it this way. And that's where you get the bottom, this, this here. Right, so... But now do you have to make the mark again on the wood? Right? Yep. Okay. So what we've done is we've gone from... This piece of wood is in the second dimension. That is, it's got no bend or twist in it right now. We go up to the boat, and the biling, spiling batten is bent and twisted onto the boat, going into the third dimension. Then we take the spiling batten back down, and we lay it on this plank stock. It's back in the second dimension. But we know, because of the way the wood bends, that when we put this up, they pretty much fit. These bow planks especially are very easy. You can see they're fairly straight. They don't have a lot of curve or twist in them. And they have almost zero hollowing in them. So a bow plank, it make it a matter of just a few hours. We've marked our layout of the butts is the same as it is on the port side. And one of the reasons you do that is so you don't have to lay it out once, but also you keep everything consistent. So up on the hull here on our new, on course number six, we've drawn a line that represents where the butt will actually be. That's the end of the first plank. Yep. Okay, Clint. Here's here's the block. I'll give you the sacred block. And uh, as soon as you get that up and start marking it, let me know. And then uh, I'll... Uh, the first one is the one you have downstairs. Right. This is the second. Exactly. Now, what you do with the batten is you try to center it in the plank opening as best you can. And you'll see that the batten is a straight piece of wood. Yeah. But the boat's curving like this, the plank's curving. So it'll be closer 
at each end. See how it is here? Than it is in the middle. Need to go up a little bit on your end. Yeah. And you know you can you can use clamps or you can use little nails. We just use clamps because it's quicker, I guess. And then how many um, little marks would you make along the way? Well, we've been doing each frame. Uh, you need a hand, Clint? Or you got it? No, I'll get it. You can see this piece of wood right here, too, that's got a real curve yeah, to it. Now, is, that, is it got a frown or a smile in it? It's got a frown. That's what we want. Because the frown down when it tucks under there. Because the plank will have a frown in it. When you, sometimes if you cut a piece of wood, it'll relax into a slight curve, and that's fine. It can help you. And we need all the help we can get. traditional method of doing this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much a plank of any length, which all of ours are. It's pretty much the only method. I mean, you remember your little experience, Clint, with the, the guy making the patterns? Oh my. This is the fastest and most accurate. See, because we're using yellow cedar battens, and yellow cedar is a very elastic but stable wood. And it bends and twists fairly easily. So that when you take this off the boat and you lay it flat, it's not going to get any weird movement in it that's going to change the, the way you laid out the plank. You just put a little glue there. Yeah, we use a hot milk glue gun to glue the yellow cedar. It really glues it nicely. He's going to make a mark here, a vertical line, basically. We always go longer, so. And he put the initials TB, which stands for true butt. If there's something wrong with the stock, like there's a check or a knot in it somewhere, yeah. we'll know how to move it around to avoid that imperfection in the, in the actual plank stock. And I'll show you that when we get back done. There's imperfection in all stock that I've ever seen, I believe. This is seven a seven two. That's course seven, plank two. And Do that, that in a couple spots. Arrows mean, of course, up and forward. If you have an arrow, it means forward. If you have an arrow like this on a plank or whatever piece of wood, it means up. Obviously, this plank is very long, so you really don't need an up arrow. But we do that so that when you get down on the plank bench, the other guy, that would be me, can instantly look at it and go, oh, that's up. All right. These are handy little spiling block here. Make a mark there. Flip it down to the plank line. Line it up. In the middle of right here. Close. They're real close to in the middle here. As, as it'll sag right here, you'll see a difference. But the, and the plank block, line is this brown line right there. That line right there in the bottom of gotcha. the upper plank. But this never lies. It so never lies. No. no matter how funky this looks when it's laid out on the table. Whoa, that's kind of weird looking how it goes yeah. up. You put the spiling block on there and batten the line on there, and you'll see exactly what the plank's going to look like. We also have bolts we previously put in. When we put the planks up, we have to relieve the back side of the plank to go over those to get a good fit, too. Yeah. While we're fitting it. <laughs> Did you just hollow out a little bit? We just take a, take a spade bit, because that'll mark itself. Yeah. The center of the bolt usually marks perfectly, and you take a spade bit and just relieve it a quarter inch at the most, maybe. Whatever it is to get over that head of the bolt, the plank sits you on it. You just basically hit it. You, usually you don't have to hit it because when it's clamped on there, it makes a nice mark. But then how do you get, do you actually drill out a little bit of for the head? Yeah, you yeah. flip it back over, you take a spade bit or butterfly bit, some right. people call it, and you just go right in the center of the marking. So is it worth just going, doing all the tops? Just go, go across the top? Oh, no. no, no, no. Up? Have you tried both ways? No, just like he said, to do it this way, that way when he lays it out, you don't want to waste any of that wood. Right. So we'll do all three of these, we'll spile them, lay them out, and see which works best. 
Okay. Because <clears throat> if you just go yes. ahead and cut one, you might have just cut off a bunch of wood that could fit another plank. Nice. What you're always shooting for is, of course, the clearest lumber you can, with no imperfections to speak of. Like a little bird's eye like that, nothing, it's nothing. But you see how I've marked these areas? The no fly zones. That's because there's fractures here from near the heart, where the heart was. Remember, they cut the heart out of the tree. Okay, yeah. Uh, that's generally when the tree is felled and when it hits, it'll put a big shock through the whole tree and that'll manifest itself later in these cross fractures, cross grain fractures. So you inspect them all and get rid of that. Checks on both sides, get rid of them. Got a couple down the other end. So you've isolated the good lumber. Our goal has always been to get three planks or one entire course out of one slab. And in fact, on a couple of them, we got four planks because they didn't have this. And we're going to be able to do that here. And this is the sapwood. See the lighter color? Okay. You want to avoid that because it'll rot, especially above the water line. So you can take your spiling block and you go to this line here and you stay a quarter of an inch out of the sapwood. Okay. Yeah. Now this slopes slightly outward, so the sapwood is going this way. So we know we're going to clear it if we clear it on this side. It will certainly be clear on the other side. Sometimes, if it's sloping a lot, you can go ahead and use the sapwood because we're going to take nearly a half inch off of this planer and okay. it will disappear. Okay. So we come down here <clears throat> and we make sure we're clear of all that stuff. And you keep shaking the batten like this so that, so that it's not taking a set. You're not bending it. We're pretty good here, okay? Okay. All right, so you're gonna tap it down there. Okay, we got a little nail in there. That's also a little pivot point. Just check it a few more places. Make sure we're gonna clear the sap wood. I think that was a little close. Let me... So we've got two planks laid out now. And so, the process is to go back when this was on the boat, remember we were in the third dimension. It was curved and twisted. You know, because yeah. this wood twists very true. When we lay it down in the second dimension, which is what we're in right now, and we mark it, we just cut the plank knowing that it's going to act like the batten and twist correctly. And I've already checked this one. We're good on it. It's clear of all the defects. So we'll nail it down. Can't mean. Okay. The stern plank can come out of here. Okay. Um, the third course. Is... Uh huh. It has a little bit of a hook this way. So it'll probably come out this way. Out of this plank. So we'll just make a faint mark here for the butt. We don't care about that. Uh, it's nothing with it at this point but a reference. Okay. You take your block, which is hooked and hooks over the batten. We lay it on here. We start drawing lines. You can see how fast this goes. When you're planking down, or down, you, you want to cut your butts 90 degrees from the top edge of the plank, which would be, of course, 90 degrees from the bottom of the edge of the plank above it. So this part here where Clint's marked the true butt, after we saw this out, I don't care. I cut that down here and it'll fit 99% of the time. So, and you can see in just a few minutes, we've taken this batten and we got a plank pretty much laid out. Well, I'd say by the time you're all done, it's pretty close to an hour. Between him, you know, yes. a couple hours to do all three. It's about an hour from the time you put the batten up yeah. to you're ready to saw the plank. Yeah. About an hour. We're ready to run our fairing batten now. You want me to file that or wait, 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 take wait. that? Oh, you know what? 
I know what we did on this side. We were thinking of splitting it, mm -hmm. but we didn't have to. Now that we know that, okay. make a pattern Okay. like you do on the bow. Yeah. About, you know, 18 right. inches long. Yeah. Good. Good, good. The third spiling batten. Yes. Starboard core seven of three. Fairly straight plank. Uh, but we're springing this bat into our marks. So you leave the mark showing. And, uh, you know, every three or four feet, whatever. Because the, 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 the marks generally take care of themselves. And there it is. That one right there. Now, this is the top edge of the plank, <clears throat> which means it's going to be fitting against our existing planks. So when we cut this edge with the skill saw, now this is important in planking, especially when you're in the middle of the boat here where things are pretty much 90 degrees on the seams. You want to cut this right to that line where you, just the line is left. That way when you go to plane that top edge, Basically what you do is you just plane until the saw marks just disappear. You know you're there. You see guys are afraid of it. They don't trust their spiling. They'll cut, geez, a quarter inch over. And they'll sit there for an hour and a half. <laughs> Getting a hell of a workout, but it's, it's not necessary. Now, conversely, when we cut the bottom edge, because there's no plank in the way, we cut it a good eighth of an inch too wide so we get the two planks up, two, fitted. Then we run a very stiff batten along our marks on the bottom edge so they flow together. If you look at the butt there, right. those two planks just flow like this. Right. So the next plank coming up fits. Two to three hours per plank. For what? By using those two methods I just told you. Cut right to this line, don't be afraid of it. And that way you can just plane till the saw marks start to disappear right. and you're done. So you'll cut this with what kind of saw? Skill saw. With the skill saw. The, this open end, we'll call it. There's no, there's no plank below it yet. Right. Just cut that rough. Right. Eighth inch or so over. And then once you've got your planks fitted, then you run a batten to your marks on the bottom edge and power plane it down here. Okay. Remember I was doing that last time with the power plane? Yeah. That's what I was doing. We took this spiling off of the existing plank lines, which were what they were. We don't know how good they really were. <clears throat> this plank is what it is. And it's a really nice line if you look down it, because it's it's the bottom of the of our new planks. This one kind of goes torn. Kind of looks like a mountain road. So you do yourself a really big favor and make that a nice line. This, in other words, what I'm doing here isn't entirely necessary because the way we're stacking down, we just, we cut this edge wild anyway. Right. And we straighten it out after it gets up on the boat. After we drill it, we run a batten, we bring it down, plane it, paint it, put it up. A pencil is almost useless on this wood because you can't see the line. It's the same color as the wood. Right. So we use a very sharp sharpie. And it doesn't matter on these if you cut the one or number one or number two first because they both basically go up at the same time. Okay. We know it's going to fit the first time because of this is essentially 90 degrees, the seam, and the frames are almost dead flat, and the plank itself only curves and twists a small amount. Mm -hmm. The second plank is a little bit more than 90, that changes too as you go out. 
In other words, up here, it's about 90. But the bottom edge is going to roll out to 100 degrees so that the next plank coming up in that curved surface is meeting not a 90 degree angle, but a bisection of the angle of that curved frame. So the planks basically have the same angle. You'll see guys putting every third frame or so, they'll put 82 degrees, 79 degrees. From what? <laughs> it's, it's from 90 from the plank or the frame face. It's kind of hard to describe. But no, but it's right, because the uh, frame not, face is facing out. Yeah, it's not 90 from the surface. No. So I don't even bother doing that. I put the plank up, we run our batten. Put a little gauge up, right, one, two, three. One being a sixteenth, two being an eighth, three being and so forth. So in the time that, that I'm laying these out, Clint's spi is spiling the third plank. Right. So by the time I get this one drawn, he'll hand me the third batten. We'll put it on here and draw it. Right. So I have three planks sitting here, ready to cut. It's just Great. Six. That's it. Okay. First step. Cutting out. Cutting out. I'm gonna leave those two. Come back to those. Well, we have. It uh, looks like the engine exhaust coming in, three planks down. Okay. But there's some backing blocks in here that I gotta check out before I cut it. Gotcha. I'm gonna go moving something okay. before check we mark out. exactly where it was. Where are we? We're in the outskirts of the engine compartment. If the boat were level and we had one spot on the boat that we knew was the waterline, we could take a clear hose with water in it, use it as a water level, and just walk around the boat and mark it. But since the boat is a good foot or more down in the bow, uh, that's useless here. So we make this jig. You see these marks? These are holes we drilled in it. So later when we get to the boat yard or wherever you're going to mark the water line, we just take an awl and a little tiny mark. There's some holes that are already in the... Well, this goes to specific places on the rail. For instance, scupper three, scupper two, scupper one and four just happen to be the same. We'll go to scupper three. <laughs> you centered on this scupper? Yep. And the piece of wood sets on the deck reveal. See it? Right. The scupper right is that little opening in the... Uh, in the, the, the toilet. Right. This gets bent down. Right. And this right. is where the water line will be. For scupper two. Gotcha. On the boat. And then up here we have... Um, mizzen, aft mizzen chain plate location. Stanchion one. I see what you. I see what you're saying. You made this thing and then you hung it and marked off the old water line. Right. So and then, right and then, we, then we bend it down. Right. Let's see the water line there. And that's where it is right now. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's got about six, seven locations. That's all you need. Beautiful. And then, like I say, when the, your first paint job will not involve a bootstrap. Gotcha. Just take the white paint right down to here. Yeah. Um, because it's always easier to bring the bottom paint up and take the white down. Launch the boat, sail it, let it, let it soak up some water, put all the gear on board, and then six months, haul it out. And by the way, when you first launch a, we'll call this a new boat for now, all these timbers are gonna swell in different uh, directions and different amounts. Mm -hmm. So the first fairing of the bottom, you get it pretty nice, the bottom decent but don't go crazy because that's gonna things are gonna swell and you know and just one coat of bottom paint don't let the boatyard talk you into painting because there's no real worms in this water you're only gonna be out for six months that way when you come out of the second haul out we'll call it your first haul out now you can take it sand it and get it really fair it's gonna be pretty much okay. you will always be at that point okay here you go Clint
the staff work for something else? Is that just trash? Firewood. Firewood. Good. At least something. Well, no. Yeah. Uh, Sapile, decent wood for a fire. It burns hot and. Uh, so it's a hardwood. Medium fast burner. Yeah. It's not as good as oak. Right? Not as good as oak, no. What's that? Eucalyptus, the red gum. Eucalyptus is good? Yeah. Good uh, firewood? It's full of uh, wood. Yeah, yeah. So it's very snappy. Come on, Doug, show people. They care about you. They care. Look, he hurt himself. Purple heart territory. Fall. Let's get to, yes, before we leave, we'll take a look at Doug's new toy. So there's a nice finished cut seven, port seven, number two. See the crack that I marked is here and here, see them? Yeah. But it goes like this. And here's another one. Mm -hmm. But it looks like it's only this deep, see it? No. Yeah, see it right there? Okay. It's like it goes beer. Well, the plank can only be this thick, so I think that'll plane out. If this is the, the side you take off. It will be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it likes it or not. See, because we have, on this plank, there's no shaping on the inside, so we have options. Right. So thick how thick is this, is this board? Right now? Yeah. Inch and a half. And how thick do you want it? Uh, the net thickness on the boat is an inch and an eighth. In inch and an eighth. So Slightly under an inch and an eighth. And of course, the last four or five feet on every boat the planks take about one inch okay. in the stem. They get they get thinner. Yeah, like this. So if you go up there and look at the stem right now, you'll see about an eighth of an inch of meat. Yeah, it still needs to be planed down. It's an eyeball thing, you know. You got to just take it down to the stem and just work your way back. All right. The stem is the is the piece of wood from the forefoot to the top of it. Right. right. Some people prefer that entire structure as a stem. All right. Well, as far as I can tell, every single piece of wood on this boat, all 3,000 of them, have their own names. <laughs> all 3,000? Each one has its exact own name. Yeah, yeah. most of them are 400 words. No, I <laughs> like this one. Is my hair in place? Your hair is in place. You have some. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this butt block is for the starboard side. 23, 24, okay. Uh -huh. That's the frames that goes between? Yeah. It goes, this is the inside of the butt wall. Right. It's not quite square, see that? Okay. Because the top and bottom edge follow the plank line. Sure. They lap over about a half inch, plank above and below. Right. But because of that location on the boat, this butt block is almost dead flat. Okay. Okay, this is an easy butt block. Now this one back here, because the frames are further apart, you make the butt block as big as you can and it still allow for drainage. Okay. And so this butt block, would look like this from the inside of the boat on the starboard side. Right. Because the frames are canted yes. relative to the plank lines, this is how you cut them. So when you look at the butt block, it's not just this clunky thing sitting in there. Mm -hmm. I know you could... Also, this one was more difficult because... Not difficult, but time-consuming, because it's got quite the curve in it here. See it? Okay. Yes, it does have okay. a little bit of a curve. And that curve, as you move just a few inches up the boat, changes. Okay. So the butt block actually has a little bit of twist. Camber, there. yeah. Oh, bend and I mean camber and curve. Yeah, and this twist. curve in, increases as you go this way. Okay. So the way you do that after you make the butt block, you slide it up against the frame and draw that. And slide over here and draw that. You keep monkeying with it till it fits, so that when the plank comes in, it lays nice. Nice and flat. And here is the new. Addition to the family, Doug's electric bicycle. It's a Tesla motorcycle. Nice. It's an electric third bike, pedal options. Look at that thing. 30 miles an hour, about a 40 mile range. It does okay on the street, but it's really an off-road vehicle. I've had it out in the sand quite a bit. So you're pleased with it? Oh yeah. Um, and what, who makes it? Per, pet, Pedigo? Pedigo. Pedigo. Well, this is... a. Uh, medium to lower priced bike you can go as crazy as you want i mean pedigos go up to 10 grand wow you know and, and where'd there. you buy was there a store around here or online yeah up in ojai uh called the mob shop pretty knowledgeable guys 
and uh, it's a 48 volt motor, brushless motor, seven speed uh, manual transmission for the pedals. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so when you come down from uh, your mountain home, mountain home, when you're mountain home, or your mountain retreat in the morning, you pedal most of the way. No. No. Uh, I, I'm learning the bike path on this bike. As you get as your speed up, <clears throat> you let off the gas. We'll call it. It'll go a hundred yards at twenty miles an hour. We'll just keep going. Right. So if I know a curve's coming up, I just let off, coast, and then that's when you go to accelerate out of the curve, I give it a pedal assist. <clears throat> Saves battery. Sure. I could go all the way home and back without even touching the pedals. But, and besides, part of the reason for having it is the exercise. Sure. Sure. Want me to take a spin? Yeah. On? Let's see a little demo. All right, see you later. Whee! I feel like Pee Wee Herman. <laughs>